nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut You know, there's something really nice about flowers, don't you think? Wild flowers. There's something nice about the fact that they're flowers, and there's something nice about the fact that they're wild. Among naturalists, the two most favorite subjects are probably birds and wild flowers. And I must admit that even though there are millions of people who spend a lot of time going out looking for wild flowers, I've never really been one of them. I'm far too easily distracted by the bugs and the birds and the other things that go along with wildflowers, but the more I think about it, the more I kind of like them. I mean, look around us here. This is just wonderful. Canada anemones blooming right here, and uh, there are some buttercups out today. I see a little bit of um, some sort of purple vetch in the pea family, and uh, there was some bed straw over there as well. It just goes on and on. It's a nifty aspect of the natural world, and I think we should spend today paying a little bit closer attention to that nifty aspect itself. It, uh, it reminds me of a, of a hike I took last year. I wound up with a group of four gray-haired ladies walking up a, a place called Potato Mountain. And, oh, they were very good hikers. I had a lot of trouble keeping up with them. But uh, every once in a while they would stop to look at a flower and they would gather around it and they would identify it and name it with its Latin name and then they'd all say, it's very sweet. Isn't it sweet? Oh yes, it's very sweet. And I thought to myself, that's great. What a simple pleasure. Bird watchers rarely use scientific names, but flower enthusiasts use them all the time. You know, flowers are very closely tied to human cultures. We have all sorts of strange beliefs about flowers. Have you ever heard of the buttercup test? I just heard about it a few minutes ago. It's wonderful. Apparently, if you hold a little buttercup under your chin, and if your chin kind of reflects yellow, then you like butter. I don't know how else you'd ever determine whether you liked butter or not. The buttercup test, an example of flowers in our culture. You know, sometimes a rugged, woodsy guy like me can feel a bit self-conscious pursuing an interest in wildflowers. And I occasionally wish I could transform into one of those classic botanist types, you know, the earthy, cultured, old world sort of guy. I could hide behind that disguise and go wild. myself situated in um, amongst a group of equisetum, which is a lovely sort of plant, a very primitive plant, 
it's called a horse tail really and did you know this plant has no flower it's not a flowering plant at all and did I have a plastic dinosaur and I carry it for a reason to demonstrate that in the days of the dinosaur during the Mesozoic period these plants would grow many meters tall and they dominated the landscape and the dinosaurs would eat plants like this and not plants like this this is a flowering plant here a bed straw the dinosaurs spent their entire 150 million year period with very few flowering plants on the scene. Pardon me, my lip is slipping a bit here. And then at the end of the Cretaceous period, the flowering plants began to proliferate, to evolve, to, to dominate the landscapes. And the dinosaurs, they died. They simply vanished. And it was a great mystery, after which all of this was lost and all of this around us developed. How wonderful, how very intriguing, how interesting indeed. The flowers of many wind-pollinated plants, grasses for example, are so tiny and dull that we often forget they are flowers. There are many, many different types of pollinators. Most of them are flying insects. A good example might be a bee. If I were a bee, I would be flying around, I might see these clover, and uh, I would see them in a different way than we do because bees can see in the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. Most flowers have um, patterns on their petals that are only visible in the ultraviolet range and these patterns direct the bee to the center of the flower where the nectar is. Flowers produce nectar but they don't produce it for themselves, they produce it to bribe bees with, to give to the bees, so the bees will come to the flowers, drink the nectar, and in the process get covered up with pollen, which they then inadvertently carry to the next flower that they visit, and that's how the flowers get pollinated, get fertilized. Some bees, of course, take the take the pollen away as well. They have pollen sacks on their legs, they take it back to their beehive and they eat it, but that's okay because flowers produce so much pollen that there's plenty left over to do the business of pollination. Some flowers smell like decaying flesh. Others smell like female bees, all to attract and fool the insects that pollinate them. But you might wonder why there isn't just one kind of bee and one kind of flower. Why all these different species of flowers? And by the way, there are thousands of different species of bees and there are even probably millions of species of pollinating insects. The reason is not all pollinators can pollinate all kinds of plants. It's a complex world. Bees can pollinate these clover, different kinds of flies, some beetles, butterflies here today, but um, a flower like, well, let's say a thistle with a very deep bloom, the nectar is way down deep in there, and the only things that can pollinate a thistle are things like hummingbirds with a long bill, or butterflies with a long proboscis that uncoils and goes way down in there to get the nectar out of the base of the flower. Uh, a fly would just sit on the top of the flower and poke around, it wouldn't be able to get at the nectar at all. So it's it's great, the, the fact that so many species of flowers and so many species of pollinating insects and not just insects there are also some flowers that open only at night they are they will be pollinated either by night flying moths or even bats can you believe that bats with long tongues that stick their face in the flower their tongue goes down gets the nectar and their face gets all their hairy little faces get covered up with pollen and they pollinate the next flower that they go to wonderful can you believe that it's great Long-tubed flowers are usually pollinated by long-tongued insects, or hummingbirds, or bats. You know, one thing you can't help but notice about flowers, they don't move around very much. That's because they're parts of plants, and plants don't move on their own steam. It's a good thing because you can walk right up to flowers and get a close look at them. You don't have to sneak up on flowers the way you do with birds and butterflies. Of course, they don't really behave, and if you like behavior watching as much as I do, then, you know, it's a bit of a disappointment. But I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of nifty things about flowers and the pursuit of wildflowers. 
You know, in most places there are more species of flowers than there are birds and butterflies put together, so there are lots and lots of different opportunities to get to know individual species. The other neat thing about flowers, the thing that uh, many wildflower enthusiasts find intriguing is the fact that each species of flower is only out at a particular time of year. So that let's say if I were suddenly transported here by a time machine, aliens, amnesia, all that kind of thing, I could look around and see the wood lily and the vetch, the bed straw and the last of the wild roses, and I could guess that it was probably somewhere around the first week of July, and then I wouldn't feel so mixed up, which has got to be good for something. You can go out, make yourself a flowering calendar for your favorite place, whatever. That's a, that's quite an ambitious thing to do, but a, f a fun thing to do. You have to get out, you know, through the whole season and, and uh, build up your calendar that way. Or, for that matter, lots of people just like getting out and sketching flowers, painting pictures of flowers, putting flowers in flower presses and having pressed flowers, or taking photographs of flowers. Oh, this is going to be nice. That should be a beauty. We're all accustomed to garden flowers, but have you ever thought, what's the difference between garden flowers and wild flowers? I mean, apart from the fact that all garden flowers were originally wild flowers that were bred to be bigger and more beautiful. Well, think about this. These plants here were planted. They were planned. They are here because some person wants them to be here. And that same person has to come and pull the weeds out of the soil. They have to water this garden. They have to pesticides and herbicides and all those kind of sides on this garden and there's this all this energy all this effort that goes sorry plant all this effort that goes into this garden that doesn't go into a wild situation at all it's a profound ecological difference the um you know i'm not much of a gardener myself you probably never would have guessed that but it seems to me when gardeners say that they like making things grow it's probably true. Nothing against gardening, but a lot of the things gardeners do are the exact opposite of making things grow. Pulling weeds out of the ground, killing bugs. I guess they like pulling weeds out of the ground. There's a difference here. The difference is that gardening is an exercise in controlling nature and directing nature and making nature into what you want it to be, whereas wildflower appreciation is an exercise in letting nature do its own thing, letting nature take its course, and then you come along and you appreciate whatever nature just happens to have done. It's kind of nice that way. Right then. Now, you realize that the story of the flower really only begins with the flower. Why, would, why did the flower exist in the first place? What was the flower's purpose in life? I mean, certainly attracting the pollinator is important, but once you're pollinated, so what? So what's the point of it? What happens to the plant once the flower itself has dried up, once the flower has fallen, once the bloom is off the rose. What happens at that point? Why were the flowers there in the first place? Well, let me tell you the secret of it all is that the flower eventually produces seeds. The female part of the flower is pollinated and then it produces seeds. And in some cases it swells and becomes a berry or a piece of fruit and even nuts. And the entire purpose of these structures is to attract animals so that little squirrels will pick up the nuts and birds come and take the berries away. And in that way the seeds are transported to a new spot to begin a new life as a new plant. In fact, some of them can only germinate once they pass through the digestive system of an animal, if you can imagine anything as revolting as that. But on the other hand, they do begin their new lives within a little bit of fertilizer, which must be a nice thing for them. Now, of course, not all seeds are dispersed by animals. Many are dispersed by other factors, such as the wind and the actions of water. I hope, then, that, you've that you agree with me that plants, uh, 
flowers on plants exist first of all to attract pollinators and secondly to produce seeds and that this is their role in the in the natural system of things is quite really remarkable. They don't exist simply to beautify our surroundings, although well, certainly I think you would agree with me that they do beautify our surroundings quite a bit. Yeah, this is research of problem at times. But you know that that they Many, many people use flowers as metaphors for love and, and affection and all these emotions that we are prone to from time to time. But that's not why they're here, although they do function in this capacity. Uh, flower names, most flower names are not terribly romantic either. I mean, musicians use flower names in their songs, don't they? And if I hear another song about a rose, I don't know what I'll do. What if musicians had to use the names of wildflowers instead of cultivated flowers? Oh, they could produce lovely lyrics, and it might be at the end of the day you could have a tune that was quite different from anything that had been done before. Oh, in fact, the more I think about it, the more amusing it might be. I can hear it in my head even as we speak. Oh, yes. Hi. You know, as part of my newfound love of flowers, I've been admiring these brown-eyed Susans. Where do you think they got their name? See, that's about five brown eyes. Makes for maybe two and a half Susans. It's a bit of country music humor. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me play you a song now. Two, Just three, wait for the band. Four, a two, two, three. Oh, I could be your tall, lungwort baby And you could be my faithful blue-eyed grass Love is pearly, everlasting, a creeping mahonia A plain and yellow toad flag says we were meant to last Our love is like a warm, woolly flea bean. But don't you be a false asphodel just use your common skullcap, don't yucka or buckin'. I'm tired of playing hounds, tongue howling at the moon. I could be your doll, lungwort baby. And you could be my faithful blue-eyed grass. Love is pearly, everlasting, a creeping mahonia. The plain and yellow toad flax says we were meant to last. Well, the strawberry blad is a viper's bug gloss. So touch me not, you stinkweed bladder pod. I can't stand the agrimony. It makes me want a milk veg. Like a nodding beggar's ticks, I turn my head down to the sod. But maybe I'm a heart-leaved Alexander. There's no contorted louse ward left in me. Flixweed, I'm a crying in my rag wart. I'll bounce back like a stemless rubber weed. Oh, I could be your doll and your baby. And you could be my faithful blue-eyed grass. Love is pearly, everlasting, a creeping mahonia. The plain and yellow toad flax says we were meant to last. Here we go. But with you I'll soon be stucka I'm a jolted by skunk current When you are next to me Oh, I could be your tall, lungwort baby And you could be my faithful blue-eyed grass Love is pearly, everlasting A creeping mahonia The plain and yellow toad flag says we I have a creature in my shirt. Oh, well, I guess I was the one who said I like the bugs more than I like the flowers. You know, I was just about to identify this little flower here, and then I noticed there was a dead fly in it, and the fly has been killed by a crab spider. 
pollinators go to flowers and predators wait in the flowers to surprise the pollinators. It's not all happiness and joy in the world of flower pollination. Kind of too bad. Anyway, this flower, to me it looks like a bluebell. I mean, most people would recognize that as a bluebell, but I looked in my flower guide. There are all sorts of wonderful field guides to wild flowers, and most of them don't have all the species of wildflowers, but they have the common ones. It turns out that bluebells are not just one kind of flower, they're a whole family called the Campanulaceae. So I'm looking through the bluebell family, and I did find one that looks quite good, part of the bell flower group, the genus Campanula. Now wildflower people seem to just love using Latin names in a way that bird people and butterfly people really don't, so uh, I will too. Now let's just check and see if this is a reasonable assumption. Campanula are herbs of a diverse appearance. They um, have larger, longer petioled leaves at the base. The flowers are terminal or axillary. The calyx is five-lobed. The corolla is five-lobed. They are often bell-like, purplish, blue, or blue to white in color, uh, with free stamens. No, five free stamens and there are 29 species in North America. And I noticed that there's one here. All of that makes sense, by the way. I mean, I can't say that I understood it all myself that time, but, you know, there's always an introductory part in these books. They'll explain it. It's fine. It's good stuff. Uh, but I did notice that there's one that looks a lot like the one here, the Campanula rotundifolia. And sure enough, it's called the harebell or the bluebell. And it is circumboreal, meaning that it lives all over the place in the boreal region of the world. So how about that? Campanula rotundifolia looks like an identification to me, and it might even be correct. Some mountain flowers are shaped like parabolic reflectors to warm the insects that pollinate them. Well, it looks like it might just rain here, so maybe we should bring our wildflower day to a close. You know, flowers, they have so many different meanings in our lives. We grow them, we wear them, we give them on special occasions, we give them to special people, you know, you mourn with them, you propose with them, we, uh, we even decorate with them, and sometimes we even cook with them. And different flowers have different associations, different feelings. We get a different feeling from a thistle flower than we would say with a, with a lily flower. Why is that? You know, none of this could have been possible if it wasn't for about a hundred million years of flowers evolving and developing on their own, just waiting for us to come along and fall in love with them. So with that thought, until next time, I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. Bye for now. Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit. I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it. I'm just a simple case, open and shut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.